And welcome to NAEA's 13th Town Hall, Innovative Practices in Visual Arts, Design, and Media Arts. It's a long conversation with some very special guests whom you will meet in a minute. I'm Mari Rosero. I've got the great privilege and honor of being the Executive Director of the National Art Education Association, and we're so glad that you've chosen to spend some time with us for this great conversation. I always like to say I came from the visual art classroom, elementary and middle school, and worked also in uh, some museum settings and central office in Chicago and Pittsburgh public schools. And so I uh, really appreciate all the work you're doing and uh, every avenue where we provide arts education to all of our learners. So before we get started, I always like to take a minute to acknowledge and recognize the native lands that I'm joining you from. Uh, I live in Washington, DC, which is home to the Piscataway. Uh, we uh, always encourage folks to um, look up uh, who might be um, in your community. So you can look at nativelands.ca uh, and you can find uh, that information for yourself. But we do this to recognize that um, not all people across time and history have had all the opportunities uh, that they might. And we want to learn from the past and make better decisions for the future. So this is a constant work in progress, but we always like to take a moment to acknowledge um, additionally, um, given that uh, we began the town halls um, uh, during the pandemic, and now it's been about, what, 22 months later, we just like to send uh, our good energy and thoughts to everyone for uh, persevering and making it to this point. Um, and whatever holidays you might celebrate, hopefully the next few days this week, give everybody a chance to maybe eat a little too much and have some downtime to just rest and recover a little bit. So we appreciate you making time before all the, uh, the family and friends festivities might begin. Um, please know that you can uh, choose closed captioning under live transcript. Um, and once the conversation starts, we suggest that you utilize speaker view. Also, we keep the chat nice and active. So feel free to post questions and comments in the chat. And my wonderful team, Dennis and Krista behind the scenes will help to manage that as well as our guests will contribute. Um, as a reminder to everyone, if you've not joined us before, uh, we host these town hall conversations as a real life way to connect with uh, our art educator members and community where you are today uh, with the things that are most pressing and on your minds. Um, and so we tackle a range of issues and topics, but this is really um, the way that we live and breathe the town hall ethos is that those that register submit their questions in advance, and then your questions actually become the shape of the conversation that we'll have in a few minutes. So that's how we honor your voice uh, and, and hear from all corners of the association across the country. Um, the format, we take a long conversation format. That doesn't mean long as in three hours. Uh, it's actually a relay conversation. So we will start with a pair of individuals, for example, person A and B. So person A would be the interviewer person B, the interviewee, they have six minutes on the clock to have a conversation. At minute five, they may hear a chime as a signal to wrap up. Uh, they'll close out and then person A will exit, person B becomes the interviewer, person C comes in as the interviewee and so on and so forth. If that makes sense, excellent. If not, don't worry about it. It's all gonna work perfectly in a few minutes right in front of you. So we've, we've done this a number of times. It always works out great. And you get to hear a conversation thread from multiple perspectives, which is what we're really excited about. Um, we often use every second we have for these conversations, but please, like I said, put your questions in the chat. If we have time at the end, I always go through and cover anything that we didn't get to cover uh, in advance. Uh, and we have a lot of folks uh, that uh, signed up uh, earlier. And so we, we thank you again for joining. So I think with that, we're about ready to start. So I'm going to go ahead and welcome our first guest. 
So my uh, friend and colleague, uh, Kene Ijeoma, who is an artist uh, and director at MIT, has the Poetic Justice Media Lab uh, in Boston. So uh, Kene, thanks so much for joining us. Good to see you, my friend. Thanks for having me, Maya. Yep. Um, so I think we're just going to jump into this conversation because you know we've got lots of questions here. So um, Leslie asks, um, she has an interest in public art projects that teachers are doing with students. And so she had an interest uh, in things that were focusing around climate change. Now, as an artist, I know you work in a lot of public space. Um, so I just thought you might be able to talk a little bit about some of your work uh, that might be an inspiration for our members out there. Okay, great. Thanks, Mario. Hello, Leslie. Um, Last February, I actually presented my first public artwork in New York City titled The Breathing Pavilion, and it invited Brooklynites to take a break and breathe together. Um, it was inspired by a quote from Octavia Butler's book titled um, Parable of the Sorrow. And I'll just share the quote, which is, all that you touch, you change. All that you change changes you. The only lasting truth is change. God is change. So in other words, uh, the Breathing Pavilion was an invitation to breathe with each other and the environments around us and also through all the changes that were happening around us. Uh, That's a beautiful quote. Um, I think we're going to ask my, yep, my colleague to pop in uh, your uh, link there to your web page so folks can see that piece. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, and then Katie from Minnesota. Uh, is looking for something new. And so I've not heard of Orasma before, but I think it's an augmented reality piece. So she was interested in augmented reality, but I just wonder if there was um, any suggestions you might have or anything that's coming out of your media lab or your peers labs that you might be able to share with us. Thanks. Um, so hello, Katie. Um, at the media lab, we're working on a different type of augmented reality. That's, I guess you could say is a play on the word augmented reality. Um, we're looking for new ways to augment our diverse future into our present reality. Um, as you may know, the US will be majority non-white by 2045. And currently there are over 1200 languages spoken in the US. So we've been developing an artwork titled Accounting that includes hundreds of languages in a never ending video that features um, locals counting from one to 100 with a different language and voice for every number. And we're doing that so we can start to hear, see, and be that diverse future. So again, augmenting the future that's to come using our present reality. We have all these languages here, we just don't hear them. Excellent. Um, can you tell me a little bit, um, just for context, and I want to come back to that project in a second, but for context, like how many folks are in your lab? Like, how does that work exactly? Yeah, so in my lab currently, there's about 10 because of the pandemic. A lot of us are working remote, um, but I have graduate students, staff, um, and all sorts of guests and collaborators um, that we work with, ranging from architectural designers to graphic designers to research and researchers and writers, we're looking for community managers because of a lot of our, our work um, requires really deep community engagement. Um, and then we, we have developers, of course, and, and so on. And, and do folks bring their own ideas and projects or, or do you come to consensus for what you might focus on? I'm just curious what that process might look like. Yeah, a lot of the works are coming from uh, like larger conversations. Um, such as accounting that started from thinking about the US census in um, 2020 and thinking about how um, the linguistic and ethnic diversity was uh, misrepresented and um, miscounted in the, the pre just historically in the census and thinking about how we could count to 100, which is a, which is a statistical whole using as many voices as possible. Um, and that was something that we came to together. Um, but of course, everyone had these different ideas and <laughs> I narrowed it down to something that I felt was like legible. Um, right. But then that project actually in, in inspired all the other voice-based projects uh, we've been creating. And can folks listen or view 
some of that work currently or is it under or is it impact? yeah so um we can share uh, accounting dash sorry a dash accounting dot us is the website it's just a dash accounting dot us and you can uh listen to the ongoing count of people and uh we over now have over 130 languages so wow yeah and it's ongoing it would take months to watch yeah. it um yeah. it's different every time and yeah yeah very very cool thank you for uh explaining that a little bit more and then uh marlon massachusetts asks a big question and, and truly a big question so why are innovative practices in art and design needed um so in poetic justice i think we all believe in general that it's needed and just doubling down on my previous comment is that we need art to keep creating new possibilities and routes towards an anti-racist and pluralistic future that's to come so i think the more that we can show people that it's happening now already that the more when it comes in a different form that we'll all just be in like uh together <laughs> on <laughs> well i'll just know what it is no one will be surprised it'll be regular you know we won't be talking about anti-racist features anymore it'll just be anti-racist one day one day yeah um I, and i think that if there's anything that um the current moment you know i think it's brought to light that you know the power of art to bring folks together and as a means of expression but also as a tool to um hopefully address some of these more systemic issues that exist so i appreciate that your your work is helping to tell stories in many different ways so i really appreciate that so uh our our round is coming to a close here but um before we wrap up, we always like to ask each of our guests um, what you are doing for self care right now. Right, thank you. Um, so I'm doing a lot of bike riding every day, and I love to bike over bridges wherever mm -hmm. I am in Boston. I always bike over the Charles, and there's something about just traveling over a body of water that is just really. Um, just does something to my day. It's like a way to transition um, into the work day and then transition into like just the non-work day. So um, if you have a body of water near you, I, I highly recommend it. It's it's making me want to get my bike out of storage. So for sure, yeah, that's the one the one thing of uh, for folks still working in a more virtual environment, you don't get that commute time, which I think is actually like you said, it's helpful to be able to like mm -hmm. enter into something and clear your mind or focus or exit from something, uh, yeah. and the body of water just add even more to it. Yeah, that and the ice cold air. It was really yeah, well, cold today. I was like, I had to sit here and thaw for a second before I could type in my password. But you know, it was all worth it. Yeah, great. Well, Kenny, okay, uh, as always, great talking to you. And I'm gonna go ahead and uh, exit so you can get on with your next conversation. Thanks, Mario. Um, so yeah, please join me in welcoming Tim Needles, art educator and author of Steam Power, Smithtown Schools, Smithtown, New York. Thank you. Hey, how's it going? Welcome, Tim. Um, so I'll just get straight to the questions. Um, so Janice from Rhode Island asks, can you provide an example of a STEAM high school art lesson or problem? And do you have any suggestions around STEAM on a budget? Sure. Well, um, I totally understand uh, budgetary refinement. Um, so, you know, I started out my book, Steam Power, with uh, a lesson just using cardboard. And I think if you want to see creativity with kids, there's nothing better than just cardboard, scissors, and glue, because you could really see the creativity happen. And I had students design a chair. And of course, you know, there's so many different great chair designs in history. They could do some research. Um, so that's a great way to sort of start. You know, but when I, when I talk about like, you know, in high school, especially uh, taking on problems, I like to take on real world problems. Um, so, you know, it gives them an awareness of it. Uh, we use some of the UN Sustainable Development Goals, uh, which is really helpful, even if you're just informing them about these things in the first place. Uh, but there's a great uh, program called the Wyland Project um, that's you know, based on the artist 
um, and they do these murals. So, you know, we started out doing, um, you know, the, this, this mural and I wanted to make sure, you know, I live in Long Island, it's surrounded by water. Water is obviously very important. Um, so we looked at keeping the water clean and, you know, how it affected the animals. And I collaborated with the science classes um, to make sure that we were actually studying, you know, the animals and, you know, so they were dealing with some of the science and teaching the art students and the art students were teaching them some of the design and painting. So we started with uh, murals and uh, we worked with National Geographic a little bit. Um, and then we actually, it, it kept growing. That's one of the great things about a, a, a nice collaboration. So we actually started uh, going further and we said like, how can we really make a difference? So we started beach cleanups um, and uh, the students you know, brought down their sketchbooks. And then we started doing uh, smaller storm drain murals. So we worked with the town and the EPA and we looked at all of, you know, making sure the environmental paint was correct. Um, so we've been doing these and uh, there'll be a link shared from one of the recent ones we just did. We're using the same paint that they would use to draw the lines on the road. Um, you know, and it's a project that continues um, and it makes an impact on the community, which is great. Uh, and it informs everyone about the water being clean because it goes right into our drinking water. Wow, thank you, that was great. I have so many questions about that. But <laughs> Kelly from Ohio has a question too. So <laughs> um, what are some of the innovations you have implemented in the last couple of years that you will most likely continue to use? That's really interesting. The pandemic was really difficult. You know, it like felt like a failure as a teacher at first when we went online, just because you can't connect to students the same way. And I was looking at all these initials on the screen and it's like, I got to get these kids, you know, like doing something engaging. So, you know, it gave me license to kind of throw out grades and not worry about all of those things. We just focus on social, emotional learning and creativity. So, you know, we did the Getty challenge first um, and that really kind of like led the, the path for me. So, you know, I worked with the students and we all did the Getty challenge, all of the art teachers, all of the students. And you saw like these really creative results. If you don't know the Getty challenge, they asked you to remake a famous work of art with just three things from around the house. Um, and, you know, I, I actually did a TED talk on uh, creativity and I shared a bunch of the student examples um, and it, it, it allowed students that didn't see that they were creative to understand their own creativity in a new way. Um, and then I just started making my own creative challenges. So I did one, um, you know, uh, for augmented reality and I did one for self portraits. Uh, and then I asked the students like, you know, to actually start creating the challenges and they were making them. One of my favorites was the untraditional selfie project. So I asked the kids to uh, create a selfie at home without using any art materials. Um, and, you know, even students that weren't necessarily art students, you know, they were taking studio art because they had to, came up with these really creative results. They were using Cheetos, they were using nature, makeup, uh, and it was really fun. And it really allowed, uh, you know, me to really focus on creativity in a meaningful way. Uh, which I would have never done. So I'm definitely going to keep these creative challenges. And there's a bunch on my YouTube that you're free to use too. Wow, those all sound great. I'm going to have to start working with Cheetos myself. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, and last question is from Nicole in New Jersey. Um, Nicole is interested in projects that increase technical skills, but also incorporate social emotional learning, as you mentioned. Uh, do you have any su suggestions? Yeah, you know, I think it's more important than ever, social emotional learning. And, um, you know, I try to work it into everything. Uh, there's a project that I started doing a couple of years ago called the Gratitude Project, uh, where I just focused on gratitude. So this was something that, you know, gratitude helps you focus on the things that are important to you and get your mind away from some of the negative thoughts. So students actually made uh, prints uh, based on what they were grateful for. And then they made prints for people they were grateful for and then gave them to them. And then it was such a successful project, we just grew it. You know, it spread to the school and then we started going to the senior homes and working with those people. Um, and it was just great. And then, uh, you know, we started incorporating StoryCorps, which is a terrific non-for-profit. There's a, a fantastic podcast uh, and there's something called the Great Thanksgiving Listen that's really good for right now, uh, where you can interview uh, someone and actually put it into the Library of Congress. Mm -hmm. um, and then I just moved more steam into it. So I started, this year we're doing, uh, we're using iJack uh, which is an AR app to actually make the gratitude project um, augmented reality. So we could actually have all these images in the hallway and then students could actually trigger animations for each one. Uh, so it's the kind of project that's just grown. Wow, that's exciting. Um, 
So last question, um, what are your tips for self-care? Well, you know, it's another thing that the pandemic has taught me to care for myself better. Um, you know, just taking a walk in nature is fantastic, but I find that I schedule time for myself to make art, um, you know, and I love sketchbooks and journaling has been really, really helpful. Just, just venting alone. But, you know, even if you don't have time, something I've been doing for a number of years is called the one second a day. Um, so it's an app that actually takes one second of video each day. Um, and it, it creates a whole video document of your entire year. So it's visualized my year in a way that, changes the way I actually think about time, which is really interesting. Um, and I've used it in class too, to actually document what we're doing. So, you know, making art always makes us all feel better. Wow, thank you, Tim. Yeah, it's been great being in conversation with you. I wish I could ask you more questions myself. <laughs> <laughs> you too, thanks so much. Um, so uh, I, I get to introduce, uh, uh, my former colleague, uh, Natrice Gaskins, who I worked with at Adobe. Um, and I know Natrice is really creative and amazing. So she is uh, the assistant director of Leslie Steam Learning Lab uh, at Leslie University uh, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, and she has a new book, uh, Techno Vernacular Creativity and Innovation. So welcome, Natrice. Um, I'll mute myself. Um, hey, Tim. <laughs> hey, how's it going? So um, we'll start with the question. So Jennifer from Wisconsin uh, wants to know about best practices and suggestions for student-driven maker spaces. Sure. So um, in my book, I introduce readers to uh, student-driven making through what I, the cipher. So C-Y-P-H-E-R, um, as opposed to C-I-P-H-E-R, which I think you could use it still. Um, so it's practice taken from hip hop culture and it provides a structure for sharing knowledge and information, um, usually understood by those who are actively engaged in it. It's a place for people to demonstrate their practice and practice their skills, as well as a place to enact self-definition and theorize um, existence in the presence of community. Um, so ciphers kind of represent kinship building practices that emphasize the importance of sharing and collaboration. So teachers can use the cipher to set group protocols and interactions that amplify students' knowledge and expertise. So um, I um, use ciphers as a daily check-in and share outs um, with design and concept mapping and collaborative peer reviews. So for example, we use ciphers in, in the design of a dual enrollment summer course last summer that merged art, artificial intelligence and robotics for high school students. Um, so we started the day in a cipher, we ended the day and many activities throughout the day were in that kind of format. Um, so um, it always places the student in the center, in the round, and their voice is being important in that process. That's really cool. I love how you use it as a check-in. Um, so Russ from uh, Illinois wants to know, uh, he's looking for some ideas and advice on transforming a traditional 3D sculpture and ceramics course into a STEAM hybrid. So any suggestions or ideas you have? Um, sure. Whenever I consider arts and crafts for interdisciplinary teaching and learning, I do a crosswalk between the form or project and the core learning concepts. And so, for example, right now I'm working with on a crosswalk between a self-expression concept or project in the after school program and math. So participants will create, meaning young people, youth, will create designs um, for t-shirts, sneakers, and selfie walls. We'll use scale factor and measurement. So scale factor is the ratio of sizes between two similar figures. And then measurement, of course, is the act of determining size, capacity, or quantity. And so there are different ways to do that, both in analog, using grid paper um, in a traditional um, format, and then also using tools like Google Drawings, um, also using the you know, Cricut uh, software that comes with it to scale up, using it, looking at polar and uh, Cartesian coordinates. Um, as well. So there are lots of ways to bring math into the activity that isn't just giving them a worksheet with problems on it. They're actually using the math to make something. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, so Sean from Texas wants to know, uh, what role does meaning making play in your practice with new tech? How do we address novices bias for expertise? So meaning making, it designates the process by which people interpret uh, different situations, events, objects, 
conversations in the light of their pre previous knowledge or prior knowledge and experience. So when we think of learning as meaning making, it emphasizes the fact that in any situation of learning, people are actively engaged in making sense of the situation. So they, how they frame it, the objects there, artifacts that are there and the relationships, um, concepts, drawing on the history of similar situations and on available cultural resources. So when I talked about concept mapping, we do that, you do that as a design thinking practice so that they're mapping what they know with what they don't know. So in one case, they may know a lot about comics or storytelling, and then they had to figure out how to use that to talk about artificial intelligence or robotics. Um, so something that they're familiar with, and then they can apply meaning to what's new for them or what's foreign or maybe even challenging for them. So meaning making is important because what we place meaning on is what we value. Um, so um, the process of meaning making for me, um, both as an artist and as a teacher, is making a connection between the out, what is the product or output or project or whatever that is, and where they come from. So the students are like a, come with a, like a backpack of knowledge and a backpack of understanding. So they're not leaving it um, before they get into the classroom. They're using it to do an activity. That's so cool. I love the design thinking and uh, the really cool stuff you got going on. <laughs> That's very cool. So the uh, last question is, uh, what are some of your tips for self-care? What are you doing with this time? So um, yesterday I had my shingles, flu, and pneumonia, and apparently you're not supposed to mix shingles <laughs> with anything. So what was really important was rest. I had a very busy week, um, um, opening of the Futures uh, exhibition at the Smithsonian. I try to put rest in, rest in between all the activities, the pre-opening, the opening, and all that stuff in between resting um, was very important for me. That's awesome. Yeah, we could all use some rest this time of year. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a pleasure talking to you, uh, and I look forward to hearing more. Sure. And so I'm um, going to uh, pass it off to Melissa Butler, who's a writer and educator. Um, and she's um, working on the reimagining project in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, hi, Melissa, and thank you, Tim, and good to see you. Um, hi, Natri. So we yeah. have some questions. So go ahead. I just loved, uh, I've loved the conversation so far. And mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So I have some questions for you. Um, and this um, Laura from North Carolina, she's interested in. Um, innovations for our younger artists from kindergarten, first grade, or K to, K to three or K to four? Wonderful. I love that question. I was a kindergarten teacher for many years and a first grade teacher before that. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, there's a lot that um, is similar to what's been discussed so far around growing innovation and design thinking for older students, but especially with younger children, I think, um, although there are many things to consider, I think the choice of materials is especially important for younger children when, when supporting their innovation. And a lot of times when we're looking for products or kits or design challenges, a lot of the innovative thinking has been done ahead of time and put into the design of the product. And so when you give the product, the kits to young children, the actual thinking is already done. And so they're like making something work, making things happen, uh, going on a race or whatever. Uh, but the actual space to be bored, to not know, to be wrong, to change your mind isn't there. And so uh, part of my work as a director of Children's Innovation Project is to support educators in thinking about how to narrow uh, and simplify materials to using raw ordinary materials one at a time. So just take out masking tape, just play with masking tape, cardboard like Tim mentioned, wood and sandpaper, light, uh, soil, uh, you know, fragments of, of, of metal, pieces of plastic, just one material at a time. And, and, and by, by limiting the material and framing it in that way, then you open up the prompt to explore and play. And then children can 
wonder and follow curiosity and do their meaning making, like you mentioned, Natrice, from who they are, the stories they bring, the connections they have, and all of that pretend play and building something and connecting and being inspired by others, the parallel play and the collaborative play all mingle together. And then children are nurtured in, in, in the growth of their artistry and their uh, expression. Great, thank you. So another question for you from Doris from Illinois, who's curious about um, what are the ways that empathy is used in a design process? Yeah, I love that question. Um, and it's a big question. And one of the things that I was thinking is that at the, you know, at the heart of empathy is the practice and ability, although it's never we don't we don't succeed at empathy and then we're done. We're always uh, growing in that in that area. But at the heart of it is to see one's own seeing, and to be deeply deeply curious about how other people see things and understand things. And the more uh, flexible we can be in uh, our own ways of seeing, then the more we can be comfortable in uncertainty and start to unravel our identities uh, like held so fixed in one way of knowing. So I think about the example that Tim brought up about cardboard. So with young children, cardboard is one of my favorite materials to explore. And with youngest children, I wouldn't introduce scissors and tape in addition to cardboard, it would just be cardboard. And when, uh, when educators are planning lessons, it's not so much about designing a challenge with the cardboard or asking children to make something with the cardboard. It's simply to put out the cardboard and to say, let's play, let's explore. The teacher's role is to notice what's going on and to ask questions. What do you see? Oh, Maya, do you see what, what she's saying? How could you add to that? right? Oh, how could you see it differently? How could you unsee this? Oh, you think that's a boat? What else might it be? Um, how, could we, how could we bring those together? So you're expanding into a collaborative idea space as opposed to an individual space. And the, the whole intention is to be wrong and not know and change your mind and be flexible in that thinking. And when a teacher can use conditional language like might, maybe, perhaps, and open that space, then children, uh, the material is actually empathy. The material is, it is not about my one narrative. It is not about how I see things. It is, it is always being negotiated in collaboration with others. Thanks, great. Um, we got another question from Brad from Tennessee wants to know, how can arts integration help boost a school-wide STEAM program and make creative teaching available in every classroom? Yeah, that's a big one too. I, I always think when I work with schools and organizations, I like to start small. And I think that a lot of times when you're bringing educators from various disciplines together and you want them to grow an artistic practice. You want to integrate and, and, and grow interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary thinking. We often jump right to what teachers are gonna do in their classroom. And we neglect to simply allow educators to notice themselves. And so I would, I think the best way to grow that systemic change is to get educators in a room together and let them notice a button and do some deep, deep noticing of one small object or get them some cardboard like Tim said and let them begin to notice how they go through their process and to start revealing their dispositions. Do they like to be right? Do they think they're not good at something? Right? How do they deal when something is boring? You know, because we teach who we are. And so if you want to grow uh, into a, a, you know, a vibrant space where everyone has their own processes and listens to others and can be flexible uh, and expansive, you have to engage educators with who they are and how they go about their, their seeing of the world and how they see 
uh, students in, in, in their processes of learning. Cool. Um, and then a closing question that, uh, the final question is, what tips do you have for self-care? <laughs> um, I'm with you, Natrice. I am a big uh, proponent of rest. I get regular sleep and I practice meditation daily and yoga nidra. Um, I believe that rest is not a luxury. It is for everyone and, uh, and it's extremely important. And I also eat lots and lots of plants. I believe that, <laughs> that uh, plants have lots to teach us and are, are good for our bodies. <laughs> Very cool. Thank you. I want to talk with you more about meaning making. Mm -hmm. And I'm passing uh, you the baton too. Yes. All right. Now I'm going to call Mario back. Hey, Melissa. Hey, this has been a great conversation. Hey. Uh, it sure has. And I, I'm realizing we're, we're moving at a pretty good pace. So while we talk, I'm just going to encourage if any of our other guests have questions for each other, we'll have a few minutes that we have time for some extra questions. So. I have some ready to go, but I'm just going to plant that seed in case you want to ask each other some questions after you and I wrap. Oh, good. I think we all might. Yeah. Um, I've been noticing you with your pen and taking notes as you've been listening. So I'm wondering what kinds of trends and takeaways you're, you're noticing from the conversation. Yeah, I've got at least two pages. Mm -hmm. um, you, you four are very quotable, and I think we could probably make this an even longer town hall, but my trends and takeaways, uh, I love this, uh, kind of your whole crossing bridges and crossing water it was mm -hmm. so beautiful. Um, moving to an anti-racist future through art, I'm paraphrasing there, but really powerful concepts. Uh, community impact, uh, Tim, your creative challenges, Cheetos and makeup is gonna stick in my brain for a long time. I tried to make it Fritos, but I'm sure you said Cheetos. I think Kenny and I are gonna do a collaboration on that. Um, Focusing on gratitude, uh, making art makes us feel better. Um, Natrice, your, your work with the cipher and then placing students at the center is just so beautiful. Um, I know that from other spaces, but I just love using it in, the, in our spaces um, and using that crosswalk tool for concepts and outcomes and uh, making connections to products. Um, and where the students come from, like building those bridges. And then, Teresa, you talked about the backpacks that they sort of walk in and out with and what's inside them. Love that idea. Um, Melissa, narrowing the materials, right? Um, and then framing them. And then this ability to create space for exploration and play was really strong. Um, being flexible in our own ways of seeing. Um, and then uh, you said this piece around, we teach who we are. And I thought that's so powerful. And when I know when I reflect back on my own teaching practice, I thought I was a pretty awesome teacher, but there were so many things that I didn't know that were limited by my own experiences. And so uh, just though, I mean, that's just two pages of quick notes, but some really powerful ideas coming out of the four of you. Mm. Thank you. It's always powerful to hear things mirrored back um, and connected. So I'm curious from you, uh, given this time right now and this conversation and all the other conversations that you're involved in right now, what advice do you have for arts educators? Yeah, I'll say the thing that I always say, because I really firmly believe this, which is um, as art educators, like don't put yourself last. It's not selfish to put yourself first sometimes. And that really comes back to this self-care piece because I think we are so often taking care of our community of learners and our peers and the broader community outside of school. And that has to start with us sometimes and make sure our glass is also full. So I always like to say that. The other thing that I'm inspired from this conversation that I might push on for our colleagues um, is that I'm, I'm sort of walking away with a sense of oh, in this innovative space, I, there's work with others. So I'm going to just say maybe there's something about pushing for collaboration, pushing for working with others, pushing for borrowing ideas, pushing for like figuring out how I'm in a space with others in a maybe a different way. So that might be some advice to be thinking about as we're, I can't believe we're kind of looking close to the middle of the school year already. Um, you know, it's not that far away. And, and so maybe some of those, those, 
working, you know, in the space with whether it's our students or our peers or our colleagues or our community, but like, how do, how are we in those spaces a little bit differently? Mm -hmm. And I bet, you know, the last question I'm going to ask, <laughs> what tips of self-care, uh, what do you do for your yeah. self-care? Um, well, um, at this time of year, I, well, I always like to, I'm somebody who likes to organize. So, but as the, the year comes to an end and I have a little more time at home, I like to just go through the house and just organize everything, right? It makes me feel really good. Like I'll pull out boxes of books or magazines or things that I collect. Um, but I'm, and I'm going to give this one because Tim asked me to make some recommendations for things to watch. This is not current. But also at this time of year, I love that I'm sharing this. I also spend one day where I have a, uh, I call it like the divas and movies day. So I watch uh, Mahogany with Diana Ross. I watch The Bodyguard with Whitney Houston. I watch Glitter with Mariah Carey. And then sometimes I try to add in a share movie. And I only do that one day and it is a beautiful day, but I'd like to do that while I'm reorganizing things. I know that's, I appreciate all the smiles there. Um, but that's what I'm looking forward to. It's coming up here in December. So, all right, let's go to the next. <laughs> <laughs> the bodyguard is definitely underrated. I'll say that. I mean, come on. <laughs> I'm also probably dating myself, but <laughs> hilarious. I think the well, beard does that too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, thank you, Melissa. Yes. And thanks to everybody for uh, being part of our conversation. Uh, and uh, before we go into some of the wrap up, we do have time for some conversation questions. So um, Tim and Atrice and Kenny and Melissa, I invite you to, if there's anything on your minds that you wanna ask each other, I will get us started just cause you might need a little warm up here uh, for this transition. But um, I had a couple questions that I was curious what you might jump on, but I wonder if there's, uh, a pro like a work focus problem or an art problem that anyone's focused on or working on right now that you might share? Like, is there something that's like not quite moving, but that you're struggling with or working on? And, and uh, if you might talk to us about your process for tackling that, it feels like that's part of this sort of innovation uh, piece. Anybody have something that they're struggling with or working on? I mean, I mean I'll mention, I, I'm doing an educational administration program right now. So I'm in my internship. Um, so I'm trying to apply design thinking to the school structure itself, um, which is just like, it, it's a perfect fit. You know, uh, so I, I was teaching some of the other administrators about computational thinking and design thinking. And, you know, schools are antiquated. Most of them were made for the industrial revolution. You know, and like almost anywhere you look is something that could be redesigned uh, better, especially if you collaborate and you include students in on the process and give them voice and choice and, you know, I, I think that everyone should really be part of that process. So I'm trying to push the envelope a little bit and innovate and use, you know, the school itself as a design project. Um, and, you know, there's definitely resistance, but it's an interesting thing to take on. And I would suggest like it's a great thing for any classroom teacher, you know, to make your classroom itself a design project. So, yeah, I was interested in what anyone else's advice on that is, too. I love that. I When I was in Chicago Public Schools, they brought all the heads of the curriculum areas together with an uh, architecture and design firm to design similar design the school of the future. Uh, and, and we kind of, we did this beautiful backwards design piece and, and we, we sort of blew up the school model, which ended up changing the way that, you know, teachers were instructing and groups were interacting. And um, we were really proud of our work. It was, it felt so avant-garde at the time that administration was like, how are we going to do this? And we're like, but we, but we use, we utilize the long hallway school, you know, like the three layered long hallway. Uh, and we had reimagined all sorts of ways that walls moved and stairwells were used differently. And, um, so I'd say keep pushing on that because it's, it's the right path, right? So it, it brings in some fresh, fresh ways to look at some of those age old challenges. That's awesome. Yeah, yeah, but it was a really good project. Um, if you don't know the book, The Third uh, Teacher, do you know that book? I've heard of that, yeah. Yeah, where it talks about the space and environment around you as part of the, is another teacher that uh, is in the classroom with you. It might be helpful in that work. It's good to know, yeah. I, yeah. I was looking for like really innovative schools. So I know the Blue School in New York City is, I brought my administrators there just to show like what's possible. 
and like you know that's helpful to to kind of find some of these forward thinking schools well thanks for sharing and jumping in there tim anyone else anything that anyone's struggling with that you might chat about with us or any questions that you want to ask of another one of the guests tonight melissa you have some i have a question um i'm i would be really curious about uh how the others of you um, approach boredom with students, like when students are in a space that they might call, uh, they might feel bored in the middle of their innovation or their design, their project. Like, how do you have a conversation with, with them about that? And we can also activate the chat if anyone wants to throw in their approaches for that, because I think we'd love to hear from everybody. I mean, I'll, I'll share just that I actually embrace boredom. I mean, like, I don't get bored that often because I'm, you know, always trying to engage with students. But um, I think you need time to take things in in order to actually put anything out. Um, so, you know, I, I think the noticing things you were talking about are really fascinating. And I think teachers probably need more of that because we're so focused on, you know, work and students all the time. But, you know, any artist, like, you need time to actually observe the world around you and take things in. So, but I'm certainly interested to hear what others have to say too. Anybody else on, on uh, the topic of boredom in the tree, sir, can I? Oh, so uh, yeah, I see a few things popping up in the chat. So uh, Yvette asked uh, students to describe what boredom feels and looks like. It's a gr that's a great uh, first step there. Akene, it looks like you popped up here. Did you unmute yourself? Yeah, I, I mean, I was just thinking about boredom and the role of plays in art practice. And a lot of um, artists try and go to the studio every day so they can um, feel like they're working towards something, but sometimes even into walls. And I think that's adjacent to boredom because it's a moment where even though you know you don't have anything to give, you try and give everything. And I think it's, uh, it's just, I don't try and force an idea. Actually, how I came to the breathing pavilion is I decided that I would rest and like wait for these things to come for, for me. And I like how Melissa talks about noticing. You sort of have to rest to notice the things around you. And maybe it's in that state of being bored that you start to do that. And, and what does it feel like when you just rest in the boredom? I like them taking more copious notes because I'm like, I got to remind myself to rest in the boredom. This, this sounds like good advice for many of us. Um, but again, I'm curious, I was thinking for you specifically, I was curious um, with, with, the, with the folks coming into your lab and, and I'm sure they're bringing different kinds of expertise what, how do you, how do you work with collaboration? Like, how are you bringing people together? Or, or I'm just curious how people work in that space. Like, are you, are you thinking about that and planning for it? Is it sort of happen, just happening? What, what's that look like? Um, so, well, oh, go ahead. Uh, oh, I thought I heard someone else. Was that you, Natrice? Or... Go ahead. Oh. Well, I mean, yeah, I want to hear from you, actually. So I did write I did this piece for a book that just came out to celebrate Seymour Papert and um, various folks. Um, I think it's an anniversary. Um, and it's called Purple Constructionism because um, it came from uh, some students who were, the teacher was tired of trying to challenge them. They were bored. So with the, uh, and it's funny, these are music majors and this was a music class. But the music that the teacher was um, having them play or do, uh, look at was boring to them. So he sent them to the lab um, for the semester. And so, um, but when they came to the lab, they all knew they wanted to make what they wanted to make. So by the time they got to the, the door, um, they wanted to make MIDI controllers. Hmm. Um, and so these are there were students who never been in the lab really and never used a 3D printer, never used a laser cutter, never used, never did soldering but they wanted to make this fancy and they picked a very hard project for a beginner um, to do that. But I, it was Prince that um, 
was the 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 glue for the uh, uh for the activity for the project because those playing prints had just died and I was playing a lot of prints and they're music majors and they're like yeah we heard all this stuff before play us something that we haven't heard so um I played uh the time um so Prince actually composed um 7779311 so um they liked it so much they wanted me to play it on repeat so um, it put them in a kind of a state of flow. So just hearing it over and over again, the music's blasting, they're soldering, um, you know, electronics. And uh, I could hear the students in the hallway in between uh, these sessions talking about, there's a song, um, it's really cool, and it's numbers, it's telephone number, whatever. And really, um, but Prince was really innovative in the creation of that song. So it just so happened he was using a musical interface and in an innovative way. And here they were making their own musical interfaces. So it was a really good tie into, um, but it took a kind of like tapping into what young people were interested in, tapping, and also being willing to put my own stuff out there and say, hey, I think this, yeah. thing, this song is cool. Yeah. Um, and then so, yeah, it's so cool. You got to play it over and over again. And um, it led to other sharing between, you know, the kind of expert in the lab and the students and you know, it was always something happening, always something, a uh, challenge that kept them going and no longer bored the way they were in their music class. I love that. And I, like the blurring of the lines, right? Like finding that connection between yourself and the students is so awesome and powerful, but also especially Prince can, I mean, just create and transform the environment, right? Um, yeah, it could be Prince, it could be David Bowie. I mean, we had that moment with another student. So it just depends, it depends on the, it's very dynamic. Uh, I have a lot of musical interests. That's awesome. That when I, I know when I was in grad school in a printmaking studio, the only CD in the whole room uh, was a Hall Notes CD, which you know Hall Notes I, I love, but you know it wasn't what we would pick every day. But when Private Eyes came on, everybody would do the double clap at the same time. Like we'd all be printmaking, and then when it was double clap time, everyone would stop, double clap, and then go back to work. So <laughs> it can be really transformative. Um, uh, we're, I'm noticing we're probably in our last, if anyone else has any other question or comment they wanted to ask each other before I move into wrap up time. But Ken, I was kind of picking on you for collab, how you uh, foster collaboration in your studio. So I like that Natrice uh, mentioned that these students came to the lab with the project. And I think that's the difficult part is that in this space, people come there with the project and really, you're, I mean, I think you're supposed to come to a new space to learn something different. And in a lot of ways, I want them to come with nothing. Like just come and be, see what's around you. And then what comes from that is where things should go. But a lot of people come with something that they wanna do. And then um, it's difficult to manage expectations because you really have to get somewhere and see what it's like first, right? Like you don't go to another, I don't know, when you go travel or maybe, I, actually, the example I use is like, I, I think is with restaurants, right? You may go to a restaurant, you know, you go to a diner, diner has like a million things on a menu, but it's probably true that they only make a few good things. So maybe if you go to that diner, you're like, oh, I want, I want some, you know, spaghetti, but they only really make good cheeseburgers. So <laughs> I don't know if that makes any sense, but it's like, you had to get to the diner first, see like what's on, you know, everyone's plate, maybe like, you know, notice some things and be like, oh, actually, you know, I don't see anyone eating spaghetti and there's probably a reason for that. So, you know, I don't see anyone else making MIDI controllers that aren't playing prints. Like what else is everyone doing? Like, you know, so. <laughs> That's awesome. I also love the number of food references that we have in this conversation tonight. It's dinner time. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, I'm sad that we are just about out of time. I have a few things I want to share with everyone that's joined us. But um, before I do that, I just want to uh, give a big shout out and thank you, Akene and Tim and Atrice and Melissa. Thank you so much for joining us and sharing your expertise and your passion for this work. And we shared so many links and the chat was so active. So I know folks are leaving with a lot of great ideas and connections and some new discoveries. So we really appreciate you. 
I want to acknowledge and thank uh, all of our, uh, any board members that were able to join with us. I want to thank Krista and Dennis for always being behind the scenes and helping to make this happen as well as the rest of my team. And as we close out, I'm going to pull up a few slides. And we'll just ask everyone to stay on for a few minutes while we wrap up. So um, we always like to give you an immediate tool. So our guests were kind enough to provide some additional insight in advance. So this uh, beautiful handout you can download immediately at the website or just scan this QR code. Uh, and it talks about innovative practices all the way down to self-care. So some ideas that you heard, but also some other ones that you might not have heard yet tonight. So please download that. But our town hall page has all of our, um, I think there's 13 of them now. Um, please consider uh, if this community tonight felt good, if you felt like you were understood and heard and embraced, but you also maybe were pushed and got some other ideas and, and felt some kinship, please you know, consider being a member of NAEA. Uh, this is really a community that supports one another. and We're really here for our educators. We're fighting the good fight and we're making sure that all young people have the arts in their lives. So a lot of benefits that you can see here, but if you enjoyed this community tonight, please consider enjoying it all the time. And we are really thrilled that we'll be uh, returning to in-person convention in New York in early March of 2022. Uh, but this is what I call the Choose Your Own Adventure Convention. You can choose live in person in New York, you can choose hybrid, or you can choose virtual. So it's the best of all worlds. Um, and we have really a rock star lineup, uh, not only of our great and awesome member sessions, but some really powerful keynotes and artists and guests that'll be joining us that will be announced shortly. So please consider joining us. Um, our National Art Honor Society, we're so thrilled that we can support um, our young people in schools that are valuing the arts in service to their community. And so please consider starting a junior art honor society or an honor society chapter at your school. I uh, just need to be a member to register as a sponsor and then sign your kids up. And, you know, we have such, we see such great work and projects. I know Tim's probably nodding his head because has been involved with this for a long time. Um, but uh, this is really a great way for the arts to have even more um, uh, impact in your community. And for Honor Society, uh, first time ever, we're doing a really unique collaboration with Pencil Academy and Herschel Design. You probably know Herschel Backpacks. Um, so from now till December 8th, uh, only for National Art Honor Society students, they can submit designs through the Pencil portal. It's really easy. You can submit a uh, reimagining of the um, design and color and pattern of the backpack, or you can completely reimagine that plus the shape and the pockets and the placement of all the contraptions that are part of the backpack. Anyways, 20 will be selected for uh, virtual design workshops and Herschel gift certificates that, and they'll do the workshops in January. And then two from the 20 will uh, be selected to have the prototypes of their backpacks made, They'll be invited to New York convention to share their process and experience. They'll get to travel to Vancouver to the Herschel headquarters, and they'll each receive $10,000 scholarships. So we're really excited about this opportunity and starting to outline that path from arts education in school into a creative career pathway. Uh, we have a couple of uh, our webinars and webcast series that happen monthly. You can see on December 1st, engage your students through 3D design. Uh, if you enjoyed this conversation tonight, this might be a nice next one. Our webinars are open for uh, our folks. And then you can see our webcast is coming up, exploring two approaches within the NAEA Research Network. This is the idea of research is in the hands of all of us. It's not just in uh, an elite select few. It's actually something that we do in our practice every day. And artists especially do a lot of research uh, both understanding what might influence my work, but how my work might influence others. And this is happening in the classroom daily. So that's this conversation is really focused on this with a focus on uh, a deeper dive on social emotional learning as well. And that's uh, December 9th. That one is free to everybody. And there we go. Well, uh, thank you everyone for joining us. We're going to have our closeout animation. I'm just going to ask my guests to stay on for a few minutes, but we were wishing everybody 
uh, happy Thanksgiving or just happy downtime over the next few days. Thank you.